it is a rough group to follow. Um, I keep thinking about the scripture that says pearls before the swine. Um, by training, I'm a criminal justice professor. And what I'd like to talk to you today is about history through the lens of a criminal justice person and, and what we could learn from each other and maybe how to move forward, or, or another way to put it, how we could put law and order on the History Channel. The, uh, my interest in history is in the criminal side of history. And so today I'm going to share these tips with you, my thoughts on the issue, and then I'm going to finish with a, a request where you can help me. Every family has an Uncle Harry, like my family. Uh, going through pictures with my father, who's uh, 90 years old, he's going through the pictures describing who's who, and he gets up to this one person and says, we don't talk about him, and here's Aunt Margaret. <laughs> and everybody, all the rest of us children said, wait a minute, why don't we talk about him? We just don't. Mm -hmm. But you know, and it's, why not? Well, that's Uncle Harry. Every family has an Uncle Harry. Mine was from Ireland. He was a police officer in Ireland who got in an argument with the mayor. And uh, after hitting him twice, uh, both times uh, too hard, uh, and killed him, he decided to hop on a ship and seek his fame and fortune in the United States. Um, that's how my family got here, to the States. Every family has an Uncle Harry. That makes them not weird, not unusual. That makes them normal. And every city, your city, my city, Salina, has a lot of great history, and some of it can be on the blue side. But that doesn't mean we should ignore it, hide it. But we should recognize it as part of what makes us who we are. Um, yes, you're right. I, I, I think the first time I gave a lecture, I, I had more people show up because they wanted to make sure their names weren't mentioned. Uh, it, it was a history of uh, brothels and bootleggers in Salina. And, and after giving that discussion, I was amazed that this uh, woman came in, or came up to me afterwards, and she said, I really appreciated uh, what you said about the, the madams in Salina. I said, really? She said, yes, my grandmother was one of the ones you mentioned. And, and of course, the, the sweat started immediately, but she said, you got it right. And I appreciate the way, with dignity, that you talked about what was going on. And I think that's the trick. We have to do so with dignity, but we also have to do so in honesty. Uh, James Hewitt uh, was, uh, and his wife, I'm just going to, uh, by the way, add a couple of these, uh, was uh, lodged in jail yesterday, having been arrested in McPherson on the charge of enticing away a girl of 18 years into a house of ill fame in Salina. This is in 1887. Of course, in 1909, the Reverend uh, McKenna from the First Presbyterian Church said, when I came here four years ago, there were 17 saloons in Salina with all their accompanying evils. There was gambling almost everywhere, and the town was so full of immoral women walking the streets that they were alive with them on Saturday afternoons. Now, I, some people would like to go see that on a Saturday afternoon, but that's something we need to talk about and recognize. I, and when we do this research, and I might add that the historical research is not unusual or, or different from what a cold case investigator would do. We look for several uh, ways to confirm the information we had out there. And I gotta tell you, sometimes it was exciting, sometimes it was disappointing. I found things I knew to be true wrong. And uh, sometimes it just destroyed some myths. For example, I found in the early days of Salina references to concert saloons. Um, and, and I don't know if you know the, the story behind those, but a concert saloon was the key word given to a saloon where the second floor had a different form of business going on. And I found out that in the early days when they built these saloons where brothels operated in the second floor, they were built quickly, cheaply, and there was no soundproofing. So they would have piano players in the saloons to drown out the noise from what was going on on the second floor. 
all these cowboy movies I saw with piano players, I just thought that was creating and promoting the arts in the Old West. <laughs> I found, and among these women, I, here's a great one from a, a, a Canton. My mother would be angry if she found out I was on stage acting. She thinks I work in a den of, of iniquity. Where is our, our priorities? Um, I've threatened some people to coming out with a sporting clubhouse directory for Salina, where some of the homes operated. Um, but I think it's interesting that we recognize what that is and when we go out and do our research. Um, if you talk to or see a police officer still today with all the high tech that's out there, we realize that if it's mechanical and it's man-made, it's going to fail. And, and because of that, some of the low tech stuff still works. So just about every police officer or detective I know still carries a notebook. And I carry a notebook too. And, and mine, when I started writing about horse thieves, I ended up filling four or five of these, and most of the stuff I wrote down had nothing to do with horse thieves. I mean, it, it, there were just fascinating stories I found on the way, and um, I'm trying to rectify some of those issues uh, uh, now, but um, imagine my uh, surprise when I found out that uh, a uh, warrant was issued in Justice Norton's court for the apprehension of Samuel C. Long, Sheriff of Saline County. Now in the 1800, 1879, when he was sheriff, we didn't have a juvenile detention facility, nor would they put young children into the jail. They would go into the custody of the sheriff and he and his wife would take care of them. Well, apparently, um, uh, Samuel Long, uh, Long had a different idea of taking care of uh, Miss Ella Hunt, a, a young juvenile woman, um, uh, that he put into custody because uh, he ended up skipping town with her. So when you go to the sheriff's office, there's this picture of all the past sheriffs, and I had to explain to our Sheriff Kokanowski the story behind Sheriff Law. Or, or for Salina, um, in criminal justice, there's Victor Lutzig, which is, in, in criminology, he is the king of con men. Victor Lutzig, work worldwide, he is the man that while in Paris, actually sold the Eiffel Tower to a scrap metal dealer. <laughs> who showed up to demolish the Eiffel Tower only to find out that Victor did not own it and it was not his. <laughs> Victor um, was uh, in Chicago and was challenged by his fellow conmen to a bet and uh, no honor among thieves. The bet was, uh, the challenge was to con Chicago's famous uh, philanthropic uh, uh, provider, uh, Alfonso Capone. And um, what Victor did is he went to um, Al Capone and he said, if you give me um, $1,000 in one week, I could turn it into 3000 I mean, he was a sharp dresser, but Al just didn't trust this guy, so he gave him, gave him the 1000 and followed Victor and watched him walk in and out of bank buildings all week with a briefcase. Friday came and he came back to Al Capone with the briefcase, opened it up and he said, I'm sorry, here's your thousand dollars back. I wasn't able to do it. Seven days later, he came back to Al Capone and said, listen, I got a better deal. Give me 5,000, I could turn it into 10 overnight. Alfonso gave him 5,000, no more people follow him because I could trust the guy, he brought the money back. And Victor was never seen again in Chicago. <laughs> Actually, he went from Chicago to Salina, Kansas, where he appeared in a limousine with servants, had the best suits on. He put up government bonds as for collateral for a $25,000 loan from American Savings Bank. The bonds were forgeries when they realized that Victor was gone out of Salina. Embarrassing for Salina? Sure. But it's part of Salina's history. And it's, it's important that we recognize that. Rattlesnake Pete. I mean, if you look at Kansas, the, the names are, I found out there was five Rattlesnake Petes. Each one has a great story behind them. But just one Rattlesnake Pete, uh, my favorite story was one that uh, was an Irishman known for um, being on the cattle uh, drives, uh, drinking a lot, fighting a lot, um, 
This man, though, I've got his name right, this rattlesnake, Pete, because he got bit after drinking uh, copious amounts of, uh, of uh, whiskey, and nothing happened to him. I, I, I just guess he was immune to the, to the snake bite. But uh, he visited a tent revival uh, on the cattle trail and became converted. Turned his life over to God, really uh, was saved, and to his embarrassment, none of the cowhands that knew him believed him. None of them. They knew this man. And they would tease and taunt him as he tried to convert other people. And, and there's records of him going up and down trying to get others to see the life-changing events that could happen to you when you turn your life over to Christ. People would taunt him, kick him, throw things at him. He never varied. But at one meeting that was covered by the press, a man took from his vest pocket a rotten turkey egg and hit him, rattlesnake peep, right in the face. And you could imagine the smell, and it ran down his, into his mouth and his beard. And he just stopped and he looked at people, and he goes, I still believe. As he took his jacket off, he said, however, I'm going to take a 15-minute sabbatical from my faith while I take care of the low-down, no-good, so-and-so who threw that egg. That's Kansas. That's our family. This is, this is our history. And it's filled with this. Um, Kansas, uh, as you may have, or may not know, um, when Teddy Roosevelt was president, uh, he was given an executive order, a draft of an executive order to sign to outlaw football. People were dying playing the games of football. And since its early inception in this country, it was corrupt from the beginning. Um, the quarterback for Penn State was also the quarterback for the University of Pennsylvania. The same year. <laughs> Purdue, after being horribly defeated their first year at football, went down to the train yards where they repaired the locomotive engines and, and hired the biggest guys they could find to make their front line. Hence their school nickname, Boilermakers, because these men worked on the railroad, did not go to Purdue for, for their education. So people were dying, and, and, and the clergy in Kansas gathered around, and they started by outlawing certain movements in uh, the flying wedge. They, they passed the law outlawing the flying wedge in Kansas football games. They joined the bandwagon to make uh, a football illegal. However, I might add that it was a church-related school in Connecticut where a young man threw a forward pass um, they declared it legal and, and the injuries uh, plummeted and, and that all changed. But um, I saw on your tables um, the, the picture of Carrie Nation. Um, I want to, this is from my, my little book, uh, Chasing Horse Thieves, but, uh, um, but a side story I found out. This is February 21st, uh, 1894. I found three uh, confirmations of this, so I feel comfortable talking about this. And by the way, this dates seven years before Carrie Nation uh, ever picked up her ax. We had Miss Marion of Salina. She and her husband ran a truck garden near uh, Kenwood Park. This is the second time I found where she picked up an ax after her husband disappeared, usually coming back drunk, looking for her husband with an ax, 3 o'clock p.m., walked down Santa Fe, Salina, Kansas, to 127 North Santa Fe, where everybody saw her with the axe, all the saloons closed and locked the doors. <laughs> she used the axe to gain entrance to this one saloon, looked for her husband, could not find him, but saw behind the bar the picture of Venus at the bath. She took the axe and destroyed that picture. Then she went to 118 North Santa Fe, top floor, another drinking establishment. Again, no husband. And then down to uh, 101 uh, North Santa Fe, where she did find her husband after smashing the saloon, picked him up by the ear and drug him back to the uh, truck garden. Um, Miss Marion's part of our history. Part of my concern, so I've had some great conversations with several people here, um, and one of them was a, a man that 
I think both of us in, in this conversation firmly believe a horse thief, but every time I find him mentioned, he's always talked about as a side discussion in, in the shadows of crime. Can't pin anything on him. I can't come to you and tell you this man was a criminal. So one of the things I want to talk to you about with criminal justice is when we see a crime occur, one of the first things we do is we separate the witnesses. In a traumatic event, after a traumatic event, witnesses have a tendency to talk to each other and, and create a different memory of what happened. Please, this is not a primer. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just saying uh, potentially what could happen is I could be involved in a car wreck that maybe was my fault. I might have hit a car. This didn't happen, but and please don't write down notes on this, but I could have hit a car and then run out to the person I hit and, of course, are you okay? And after determining you're okay, so then I'll say, did you see the red car that cut me off and made me hit you? I'm here to tell you, with just the trauma of a car wreck, they're going to remember that red car. By the time the police will come, they'll say, poor Mr. Virgil didn't have a choice. He had to hit me. A red car cut him off. A simple trauma like that. Think about the accounts after a Civil War battle. Or, or a riot in a community. People's memories, when they talk to each other, tend to influence their memories, and you get a different collective memory. We expect, when we respond to a call, like a robbery, that the description of the suspects by different witnesses to be different. Not horribly different, we're not looking for a, you know, a, where we get really worried if we're looking for a tall, short, thin, wide, you know, Hispanic, African American. Um, what we're looking for, though, is we expect some differences, and that tells us that they haven't influenced each other's memories. When we hear the same story almost to the letter, we assume two things. One, they're lying to us, or two, they have influenced each other's memory. And that's one of the things that we operate on, and, and to the point, I'm not sure if it was medicine or criminal justice, the law that came up with this first, but the old axiom, if it isn't written down, it didn't happen. We separate the witnesses and have them write down their accounts without that collective memory being created. And so we want to, when we do history, if I find slight differences, that tells me that there's a little more credence to those accounts. So my, one of the things I would like to suggest to you, as events unfold in your communities today, um, a couple, just a couple of years ago in Salina, for example, let me use an example. Uh, just a, a couple of years ago in Salina, we had a movement to, uh, in Kansas, sexual orientation is not a protected class in Kansas. And, and they tried to pass an amendment to protect, include them uh, as a protected class in Salina. And it polarized the community in Salina. There were two camps. And immediately, as soon as that movement started, we knew that we were going to be in for a very interesting and colorful debate in Salina. As a museum, one of the things that this would happen in your community, what I, I would ask you to do, is find people on both sides. Give them a notebook. Have them, as it unfolds, write down their, what they're seeing, what they're feeling, without, I mean, their personal ones. And then take those memories, take those different notebooks, and, and set them aside for somebody else who's going to look at it 25, 50, 100 years later so that they can have, without that influence of, of our filter of newspapers or others, they, you've separated the witnesses and you're going to get a more accurate description and make the jobs of people like me looking at, for things later on much easier if we could see those unfiltered accounts from different sides. As a criminologist, that'd be something I would love to see in history, and I'd love to see those diaries. But then again, I, I, I did not relish when two diaries surfaced of people in their 80s that rode with John Brown, and their diaries surfaced writing well after they wrote with him, their memories of writing with him. And, and then some of the historians were, that I was sitting with at this conversation were so excited because the diaries were almost exactly the same. That actually made me a little disappointed. Um, and, and by the way, time 
for memory uh, changes. I, I'm a social scientist as well. Um, when John F. Kennedy was assassinated, one psychology professor had all the students write down what they were doing when they learned about the assassination of the president. Had them seal it in an envelope, write their name against the envelope, and 25 years later, a different professor opened those up recorded those and then contacted those people and asked them, what were you doing when you heard about Kennedy's assassination? Only 7% recounted the same story. Less than 10%. Time changes our memory. Get these when it's happening in your community. Um, God forbid we see a Ferguson-like issue in Kansas again. You know, uh, again. But should something come up, please get people on both sides while it's, it's going on. Um, there's fun things. I, and again, I don't know if we have anybody from, uh, let's see, I'm just randomly opening my book here. Uh, this is 1902, the Reverend Richard Pruitt West, Methodist circuit rider who came to Kansas from Indiana uh, during the Civil War, died at his home in Concordia. Okay, this would be Cloud County. He represented Republic County into legislators in 1869, 1870, and 1876, and was voted a silk hat for being the ugliest man in the body. <laughs> That's Kansas. <laughs> um, there's too many. Um, uh, a race war in Garnett, Kansas in 1902. Um, uh, unfortunately, a lot of lynchings um, are going on for, for a variety of, uh, of reasons. Um, oh, here's one. 1888, a member of the Columbus uh, Constable uh, was uh, 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 killed March 16th, and it led to the capture of an outlaw gang that had been operating there. The outlaw gang was led by Clara Blalek, a woman. Uh, Kansas not only had the first woman mayor and then elected people, we had women horse thieves and criminals. But women were uh, and tough and taking the lead from all aspects of life in the early days of, of Kansas. And I'm looking at the other page and I see some notes on Boston Corbett. Um, I, I, as a criminologist, Boston is, uh, Corbett's interesting. I think most of you've heard him, right? And uh, know that he was a hat maker originally, and the stiff in the hats that you know hold him over the, the vats of boiling mercury, and, and, um, until he started acting a little insane, which is where you get mad as a hatter. Um, and what do you do when you're a little too insane to become a hat maker? Well, you, you join the army. Um, <laughs> And uh, in the Army in, in D.C., he was there when Lincoln was assassinated. He was in the group that cornered John Wilkes Booth in a tobacco barn. They set the barn on fire. They were, all of them were ordered not to open fire because they were going to smoke them out. The, his compatriot came out. Uh, Booth did not because Boston Corbett uh, stuck his rifle through the slats, shot John Wilkes Booth, and when they did get the charred body out, found that the bullet had entered Booth in the exact same spot that Lincoln was assassinated. And then Boston Corbett, remember his hat making days, but deemed that, that God had taken his aim and uh, the army promptly dismissed him because he was too crazy for the army. So what happens when you're too crazy for the army? You move to Kansas and become a Methodist shouting brother. <laughs> where he would preach and bind the pulpit with his handguns. And so enamored were the people in, of Kansas with his preaching and his, and his firearm powers that they made him sergeant of arms for the Kansas legislature. And of course, opening session, they always start with a prayer, and Boston felt that they weren't being sincere enough, so out came the guns again. Boston Corbett was the first man in Kansas uh, tried and found not guilty by reason of insanity. Uh, the actual, the uh, Central County Prosecutor later became a vice president of the United States. Uh, Boston Corbett was committed to the insane asylum in Topeka. Um, the next night he hopped out a window and lived the rest of his days in a cave south of Concordia. Um, uh, this is Kansas. Um, yeah, well, uh, yeah. Um, or 1887 uh, uh, um, through 8, um, you got to follow the uh, Moses Harmon saga. Are you all familiar with uh, this? Uh, mo uh, okay, uh, February 23, 1887, the U.S. Marshals arrested Moses Harmon and his son George. They're publishers of Lucifer the Lightbearer. 
and they were members of, the, this is the Free Love newspaper. At Valley Fall, uh, Falls, there were charges of circulating obscene literature. And then later that year, Lillian Harmon and E.C. Uh, Walker, uh, members of this, were also arrested for their um, free love marriage uh, service, uh, where uh, they had been married already before to other people. And uh, the Harmons uh, were going across the state promoting their paper um, and the concepts of free love and uh, both um, uh, Moses and his son did time in the Kansas penitentiary, although his relatives continued to publish the papers until they were uh, chased out of Kansas. They decided to cool their heels in London, where they found somebody with a common heart, Oscar Wilde, who encouraged them to come back, but they decided not Kansas and Arkansas. Um, we had uh, our version of uh, the, uh, the, the Klan, but it was made up primarily of women. And it was uh, for people that violated the morals. They were known as white caps. I don't know if, uh, how many of you uh, uh, white caps would uh, down white caps and they would pull men or other people out of the homes that were abusing their women and whip them with uh, buggy whips. Or in July of 1889, um, they, uh, 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 in Syracuse, uh, pulled out a, a candidate that was running for office um, and told him he should withdraw from the election and leave, or they would come back and tar and feather him. Or up in uh, Concordia, where a man uh, was uh, disregarding uh, their warnings to leave his wife alone, they put him out in the town square and whipped them wearing their white caps. But we had white cap action all across Kansas. This is part of our history. This is who we are. The um, Kansas is also known, you talk to most people historically, they tell me prohibition. That's what they remember. I carry nation of prohibition overall. Um, and they look at me as, as a Methodist and they say, obviously, you know, you're one of the Kansas Methodists. And, and I always remind them that.